Yeah, it's perfect. Good. Okay. So thank you everyone for being here. Our team is really excited to have you here to learn about our program so you can think about whether or not home hemodialysis might be a good fit for you. Um, the overview for today is so we're going to talk about some of the benefits of home dialysis, talk about the different machines that are available. We'll talk about the training process. Um, and I think most importantly and interesting for you, I have Valerie Marsh here with me today. She's a patient who has done home hemo for two years and she'll be, be able to ex share some of her experience and give good perspective on what it's like to do dialysis at home. So first, the definition, what is hemodialysis? Hemodialysis is a type of treatment that is started when your kidneys are no longer working very well. It's a treatment that works by cycling your blood through a machine where toxins and fluids are removed and electrolytes are balanced. It can be done at home or at a facility. And if you're at a facility, it will either be at a community dialysis unit or at the hospital and a nurse and technician will run the machine and take care of you. If you're at home, you'll learn to do your own treatment um, to get your blood into the machine for the treatment, you need a vascular access, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. So what is home hemodialysis? Home hemo is an independent and a home-based dialysis. You can have your setup like this gentleman with a comfortable place to sit or rest with some quiet activities like a book to read or TV to watch. Some people also choose to do their dialysis overnight, so they set up in their bed. Either way, they're comfortable, they're at home, they're in their own surroundings, and they can make their own schedule and choose to do it when it works for them. So as the slide says, um, there are some great benefits for home hemo. Uh, the kidney's role is to remove toxins and help balance fluid in your body. When your kidneys aren't working, we can rely on the dialysis machine to do some of these functions. Basic dialysis offered in center is four hours, three times per week. But if we compare this to how our kidneys work, it actually isn't very much because the kidneys are doing this important work 24 hours a day versus just the 12 hours of treatment per week. So with home hemo, you can do more hours of treatment, which has lots of benefits, including giving you more energy and uh, helping you have a better sense of well-being and overall health. Doing more hours of dialysis also means that our home patients tend to have fewer dietary restrictions and fewer fluid restrictions. Our patients also tend to be on less medications and have less problems with blood pressure. If you're doing home hemo, you can choose to do dialysis on your own schedule, which is the main reason people can choose to do more hours, but it also helps them give some control back. When someone does dialysis in a clinic setting, either at the hospital or in the community, they're given a three times per week schedule, meaning they have to be there at a set time on the same days every week. This can cause frustration and a sense of restriction for patients, and it makes scheduling other appointments and social engagements really difficult. When you do dialysis at home, you have the freedom to choose when you want to do your dialysis so that it fits into your life. We have patients who've been able to return to work and school, and generally patients express that they enjoy the flexibility that this brings them in terms of planning their lives and fitting in the activities they enjoy. With the exception of training, home dialysis patients also don't have to travel for treatment, so this saves them a lot of time and money. Through training, home dialysis patients learn a lot. Once they're home, they have the independence, and many patients express that they enjoy the autonomy that they have to make informed choices about their treatments and their kidney health. Another benefit is that being at home exposes you to less people, which generally reduces your exposure to seasonal illnesses that go around and other risks of infection. So can't just talk about the great things without mentioning some of the things to consider. Um, training can be a big commitment. It's a lot of learning um, and it does take eight to 12 weeks. Um, you can train alone or with a support person. Um, once you are home, on home hemo, you still need to go for blood work once a month. You have to do all the machine setup and maintenance. You have to come into clinic every three months. And you basically become your own dialysis nurse and technician. And some people have compared this to feeling like they have a part-time job. But keep in mind that the dialysis you do at home is in the comfort and convenience of your home and on your own schedule. So our patients do say that the benefits outweigh the difficulties. This slide, it's kind of a lot of numbers and squiggly lines, but essentially what it's showing 
is that patients who do extended hours of dialysis or dialysis overnight, they can actually have similar survival to transplant patients. So it shows the potential benefit of doing more hours, which can be facilitated by doing dialysis at home. Basically, if you can do extended hour dialysis, it's the next best thing to transplant. Machines. So for home dialysis, we have two machines. You have the AK96, which is on the left, and the next stage on the right. The AK machine is comparable to the machines used at the clinic-based settings. It's user-friendly and easy to troubleshoot. It does require a minor renovation, which is paid for by BC Renal. Whoops, sorry. The next, I forgot to change my screen. Um, these slides show um, the renovations. Um, they will be paid for by BC Renal to go in, and they will be reversed by BC Renal if you come off of home dialysis, say if you get a transplant. Um, and they will reverse the renovation so your home goes back to looking how it did before. Our other machine is the next stage. It's a very simple interface, the basics of which are quite easy to learn. The top portion is transportable. It weighs 75 pounds, and with a travel case, it's about 100 pounds. And there are extra logistics to consider if you do want to travel um, and if you want to do dialysis anywhere other than your home, but it can be transported. Supplies for travel can be provided for up to four weeks per year. This machine requires more dialysis hours to get you the basic dialysis. I've been saying that the bare minimum dialysis in a clinic setting is 12 hours per week. To get the same bare minimum on your next stage, you actually need to do between 16 and 20 hours per week. This machine doesn't require any renovations. It connects into existing water source and drain system. So next we have a video of some home hemodialysis patients talking briefly about their experiences. I would think that most people could do home dialysis. Most, if I can do it, I'm, I'm uh, 69. I thought, quite frankly, that they were insane um, trying to teach a moron like me, quite frankly, how to work this machine and hook literally up to your own bloodline um, and the air bubbles. And I just thought like, this is crazy, but it really is very simple. Um, the steps are very easy. It's very clear. It's difficult quite frankly, to make a mistake. And God knows I tried because I like to mess things up. When you go for your schooling, uh, they kind of put you through the tests and everything. Uh, and then you you get co codes that come up and, and uh, you they show you how to go through it. Uh, but when I got home uh, and got hooked up, I ended up getting codes that I've never had before. We never had in school. So I was in a bit of a panic, but there's a 1-800 there's a, a one, a 1 number that you call and they are on it like that. They don't let you go home until you really know what you're doing. That's why I say I, I uh, they made me stay an extra an extra couple of weeks. It's complicated. You got a technician doing one part and you got a nurse doing the other part. And I'm like, how am I supposed to do that? And then they explain, well, this is what we're for. We, we school you until you're ready to go home. You know, if it took longer or shorter or whatever it took, they're not going to let you go until they think you're ready and until you feel ready. That routine that you build over those six weeks um, teaches you exactly where you start, where you stop, where you are. Did you forget this? No, you didn't because you're at step four and you learn every single step. Uh, I, got, I got my nurse, Mary, she's waiting to answer my phone up to a certain period of time at night if I'm doing it at night and uh, she taught me how to manage myself if something happens. You have all that support from nurses who are teaching you and holding your hand. And you've got an awful lot of support for being able to do this. If I can do it, anybody can do it. So training, let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, patients can be trained on either a fistula or a catheter, um, whichever is in place. Training typically takes eight to 10 to even 12 weeks. 
Uh, you can train alone or with a support person. Your training is tailored to you, so we don't send you home until both you and your nurse feel comfortable and confident in your abilities to manage all aspects of your treatment. That's why I can't tell you whether or not it takes exactly eight weeks or 10 weeks, because every patient will take a little bit different length of time depending on their abilities and their comfort. Vascular access. The vascular access is how your blood is accessed to do the dialysis. We get to do a whole other presentation on vascular access, but generally speaking, there are two kinds. The picture on the left shows a catheter, which is kind of like an IV in your chest that can stay in place for months to years. The picture on the right is a fistula. A fistula is created by a surgeon who will connect one of the arteries in your arm to one of the veins. This makes a vein that has a very high blood flow and it allows it to be used for dialysis. Generally, the healthcare team will recommend a fistula. The reason it's considered the best choice is fistulas have no external materials, so the risk of infection is lower. You can shower, bathe, and swim with them, and they generally last the longest of the vascular accesses. That being said, it isn't always the best choice for some people, and it won't even be an option for some. The important thing to know is that you can do home hemo with either type of access. The decision around which one will be best for you is a conversation to have with your kidney team. Next and last thing I want to talk about is the supplies. Concerned people often bring up is how many supplies will they need for home hemo. Just like with PD, supplies are delivered every four weeks, and this results in supplies taking up about the space of a double closet, as you can see in these pictures. If the storage is a concern, we would encourage you to talk to the home dialysis team about options. Um, you can do more frequent deliveries every two weeks, um, and we may be able to come up with creative storage ideas. We've had patients successfully do home hemo living in small apartments and even someone living in an RV. So please don't let small space be a deterrent to choosing home hemo. As with PD, all your supplies and their delivery are paid for by DC Renal. So there's lots of resources available, but two websites I would encourage you to check out if you're looking for more information about home dialysis. It's the BC Renal website, and then also the Kidney Foundation website. It has good resources for patients and offers information about peer supports. That concludes my presentation. Um, and so now I have Valerie Marsh here um, and she's here to share some of her experience. Um, I've got some questions first, if we can start like that. Okay. So thanks for being here. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. How did you end up on hemodialysis? Can you tell us about your journey through kidney um, dialysis? Well, they didn't expect me to be on dialysis. I was um, in the hospital. I was having um, issues. I was losing so much weight and stuff, and they didn't know what was wrong with me. And they were filling me with fluid, trying to keep my body going. And I guess my kidneys just couldn't take it anymore and they kind of gave out and mm -hmm. I ended up on dialysis. Um, it was what, three, three years ago. Um, I did have um, non-alcoholic uh, cirrhosis of the liver. That's what caused it. And it was touch and go. So <laughs> it was uh, really, really something to think about. Um, when I started dialysis, I was really sick. Um, I'd lost so much weight. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. I was, I couldn't do a lot of things. I couldn't walk for a long time. I was in a wheelchair. I was, after that, I started with a walker. And, you know, I, as I got sicker and sicker, it went downhill and I just didn't think it was going to get better, but it did. It did. I just got positive and started thinking like, you got to do this for yourself. You got to do this for your grandkids and stuff. So, you know, it was, it's a long, it's been a long road, but in the long run, I'm a lot better than I was when I first got sick. And so you started on hemodialysis. Yes. Did you do um, any other types of dialysis? I, I did want to do the PD. I had the surgery for the PD. Um, they inserted the cat, the catheter and stuff but then I ended up with complications I started bleeding internally so and I was like okay we don't want to do this we don't want to get sicker so we changed our mind and we didn't 
do the PD after that because they had to remove it because I was bleeding internally and they didn't think I was going to make it. <laughs> so, you know, and then after that, it's like, okay, well, I'll start just going back to doing the same thing, going to uh, the hospital four times a, or three times a week for four hours a day. And it was, it was hard because I would go first thing in the morning. It was very draining. It was like really tiring. By the time I got home at noon, I was just exhausted and I would just sleep all day. And I wasn't cooking. I couldn't cook. There was a lot of things I couldn't still do after even, you know, being on dialysis. It wasn't, it wasn't changing. Mm -hmm. So, and so then while you were on dialysis, um, you decided to join us in home hemo. Yes, I was offered home hemo. It was nerve wracking, very stressful. Um, I didn't think I'd be able to do it. <laughs> I, I just seeing, seeing the blood come out of my body and then putting it back in, it was kind of really stressful for me because I am not one that likes to look at blood. So it was really stressful for me. Um, but I took the challenge and I was like, I can do this. And when I started uh, Home Hemo, the nurses, Sarah and Cindy, were really great. Um, they made me feel confident. They made me feel, you know, you know, as if I can do it and I could do it. And I, they didn't question me that I wasn't able to do it. I was like, they just made me feel more and more comfortable every time I came in. And it was getting easier and easier um, going every day coming by and getting hemo done in, in clinic here so and you were saying that you weren't feeling very well when you were on hemodialysis in center um were you feeling well when you started training when I started training I felt a little bit better um I was feeling um is it more more self-reliant like you had to like okay this you got to do this yourself so and it made me feel more confident that I was taking my own health into my own hands and I was getting better from for myself and not doing you know not listening not listening to what the nurses were saying but it's not I didn't look at it as like well they don't know what they're talking about they know what they're talking about but it kind of like I didn't feel like I was getting better until I started doing home chemo. okay because I was, I had lost a lot of hair. Mm -hmm. Like I had, my hair was chopped right off. <laughs> and uh, like I said, I was losing weight. I still wasn't eating properly, but I was feeling much more better coming in and doing this and learning with the nurses mm -hmm. of how, how to deal with the dialysis myself. And it was making me feel more better about myself and more confident. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, and are you you're doing extended hours at home? I do. When I started at home, I was doing four hours, and I still I I felt it. It was good, but then like I heard a lot of people say they would do it overnight, and I was like, well, I want to do that too, <laughs> you know. And I did. As soon as I did start doing overnight, like I would do for seven hours, I felt a lot better. I would sleep through the night. I would get up in the morning. I had my whole day. And I felt so much more awake and so much more, I was able to start exercising more. I was able to get myself moving better and not having to rely on a walker anymore. And I was able to have my grandkids around a lot more because I really miss them, you know, and it, it just got a lot better for longer the hours I did. And now I do seven hours, three times a week and it goes really good. I, once in a while, I have issues with the machine, but it's just calm down, look at it, read it, what's wrong, and it, it just comes to you automatically. It just comes back to you that what you're doing is like, okay, this is what I got to do, and then it's it, it gets easier. I'm so glad to hear that. Mm -hmm. um, what about the renovations? I know they can look a little bit intimidating. How do you find having them in your home? It, it, was, it was a lot of renovation. Well, just... I was like, oh my God, it's like, yeah, but you know what, the guys were really good, they came in, they renovated everything really quickly, and you know, they didn't make a big mess, and they cleaned up after themselves, and made everything look presentable and stuff, so it was really good, it wasn't uh, a lot of major issues that they had to do, okay. because we because we put it in our bedroom, our bedroom was right beside the bathroom, 
so the wall and the bathroom wall shared a wall so it was easier for them to put in the plumbing and stuff mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay um in the presentation we talked a little bit about the vascular access yes do you mind sharing which vascular access you have and what it's like to care for that i have a, a, a vascular on my chest um it's easy to care for um i clean it once a week um with um, saline because I'm allergic to the sticks and stuff, but I clean it really well. Um, I have never had an infection in it. Um, it's easy to clean, it's, you know, and change the bandages. Um, I change the tables once a week to make sure that they're clean and stuff and they're not getting squished. Um, and it's easy to take care of. You just remember to clean it and wipe everything down and make sure you're wearing gloves and everything when you're changing stuff. And it just, it's really easy. And like I said, I've never had an infection. Not that way. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Uh, what do you like about home dialysis? Having time to myself. Not having to get up and run out the door and having to... You know, I mean, I, I didn't mind coming here. Um, everybody was great. They're really great. But it's just, it was such a long day. It was really long and draining. So now I have, you know, I get up in the morning. I can cook breakfast for my husband. I can cook dinner for my husband now. Because before I couldn't, I was just so exhausted. Mm -hmm. And now I can do everything that I was doing before I got sick, which is great. That's great. I'm mm -hmm. so glad to hear it. Thank you. And then have you had any struggles that you'd like to share? Has there been any downsides to home dialysis? Um, I don't think so. Um, like I said, I'm able to eat a lot more and, you know, drink, drink a bit more and stuff. But I don't think I've had, I mean, I'm not in the hospital as often as I was because before I was having issues, I was in the hospital all the time mm -hmm. and because of other issues I had. But Ever since I've been doing home dialysis, I haven't had the issues that I was having before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad to hear it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Is there anything else? Well, maybe let's go to see if there's any questions and answers or. Okay. Yeah. Oh, there definitely is. Uh, <laughs> so let me just finish your part and thank you both. Uh, excellent, excellent discussion through it. Um, okay, maybe we'll start with the access part because that again starting at the beginning that came up quite a few times so we've heard about catheters we've heard about fistulas uh so just to be clear um is there a difference you know is like one preferred versus the other in terms of doing a home hemodialysis no um in terms of um what you can do we can train you on either um we don't have a preference just whatever you come to us we will work with i was also i also looked into the to the fistula but because there was a lot more I wouldn't be able to use my arm for a couple of days because there was a lot more surgeries I would have had to have it I just decided to stay with the catheter yeah and um and as Sarah said you know it's either one is okay and just to ask you Sarah is it okay if people end up switching during the time that they're on home hemodialysis yeah, that happens fairly often. People will come to us either with no fistula or a fistula that's too new to use. And so we would train you on your catheter. And then when your fistula is ready, we can bring you back um, and we can teach you about how to do the fistula. Yeah, perfect. I think you, Sarah, in the first part of the answer said it exactly right. Of, you know, we'll, we'll make it work with whatever you have. Um, there was a couple questions around the process in general for fistulas and catheters and all I just keep plugging that website. I'll, I'll uh, put people back to there on the BC Renal website. Actually, one of the webinars is all about what we call vascular access, which is these two different components of catheters and fistulas. So go check that out and it'll go through it in a lot of detail. Um, okay, then so when we get to the um, training process, sorry, I'm just scrolling up and down as we talk here. Um, you mentioned, you know, a, a lot of people, actually both uh, PD and uh, Home Demo had mentioned people being around. Are there people who do home hemodialysis by themselves or do you need to have somebody help you out to do it? No, you don't actually need anybody else at home with you. We have quite a few people who do it alone. Um, and so 
yeah, if you have somebody who can support you, we would encourage them to be involved, but it's also totally reasonable to do it on your own. Um, if you, especially in the beginning when people go home, um, they maybe are feeling a little uncomfortable, the nurses are always a phone call away um, and we're happy to provide support on the phone. Um, and yeah, people do it successfully all the time living alone. Absolutely. Yeah, um, okay, this, this one's actually come up a couple times, comes up every time, uh, power outages. What happens if you have a power outage, you're actively using the machine, uh, you know, what, what can happen there? Um, so we would teach you what to do. Um, one of the machines um, has a battery backup, um, and so it can tolerate short power outages. Um, the other one doesn't, um, but basically we would teach you how to safely deal with that situation. Um, and if your power goes out for an extended period of time, then you would just let your nurse know and they would coordinate you getting dialysis at one of the in-center, so the hospital or the clinic somewhere else. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. And, and Abbotsford actually had some experience with that last, uh, it was last year, right? The year of the bad floods. Um, two yeah. years two, ago. The two years ago, right? That's what I was trying to remember. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so just to, as a reminder to everyone, you still fall under kind of the clinic's group. So in the event of emergency, you know, they know exactly who's every, who is where. And, you know, they actually did tremendous work tracking down every single person, uh, just like Sarah said, and those who couldn't do it at home, you know, got found a place to do dialysis. Yeah, so because uh, that one comes up to not just power outage, but what if you can't even dialyze if something bad happens and you, you will be taken care of. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let me look back here. Um, right, I just want to come back, you know, because we mentioned a couple of times, you know, the diet restrictions. Um, and you had said, uh, uh, Sarah, that, you know, that tends to be less. Um, do you want to maybe elaborate on that? Does that tend to be determined by the type of dialysis people are doing, how much dialysis they're doing, those types of things? Um, so every body is going to be different. Um, but generally speaking, um, if you get adequate dialysis for your body or if you're doing more hours of dialysis, um, we're able to... The, the machine, the dialysis treatment is able to balance some of the electrolytes like the phosphorus and the potassium um, a bit better so that you don't have to worry so much about monitoring what you're eating. Yeah, exactly. Per perfect answer. And again, we have dietitians at both of the groups, so both home hemodialysis and parenting dialysis will have access to dietitians. Um, mm -hmm. But um, so they'll individualize things, but on the whole, yeah, that's the general theme. And that's why we can actually say that people have done studies on this big kind of, you know, uh, um, scientific studies that have shown people doing one of those two treatment types have fewer diet restrictions than, the, than someone doing dialysis in the center. Um, okay, uh, travel has come up a bit here. So you mentioned a little bit about, you know, one of them that sometimes does have a traveling case. What if someone were doing uh, um, hemodialysis on the other one and they needed to, to travel? How would they go about that? Um, so there are, if you're traveling within Canada and the US and then someone pretty much anywhere, um, we would encourage you to reach out and find a dialysis unit near where you're going. Um, and then we can arrange with the clinic to have you dialyze out there at a different clinic where you're going. Yeah, exactly. And then a related question came up. Actually, I haven't had someone ask this question before, but it's a good one. Somebody asked if all of the various connectivity things like the catheters, the fistula, are those pretty universal. It's a really good question. I've never had anyone answer that. Uh, and the short answer is pretty much yes, but, you know, they would be able to. It's not like, oh, if you had a catheter, you would need some new type of catheter to go over to, to do dialysis if you're traveling. But I've never had someone ask that, but it's a really good question. Um, Okay, now the couple, um, I might have everybody come back on, and I might put a couple people on the spot here. If, if Katie and Norm, you still there too, behind your, your screen? We are here. Okay, great. We're, we're, because we're winding down through our way through the questions, which is great. There's been a lot of questions, everyone, so thanks for the participation. Um, this one, I'll maybe preface it and then see if you guys want to give your input a little bit. Uh, but the question is, you know, wanting to know why people may have chosen one versus the other. I'll, I'll preface it by saying the whole reason that we're doing a, a session like this, and the whole reason we talk about this with everybody, is it really isn't a one-size-fits-all thing, 
right? If it was one, if one of them was clearly better for everyone, we would tell you just, you need to do this thing. <laughs> the fact that, you know, they're quite equivalent lets us really get down to what's going to be the best fit, uh, you know, for each individual person. So with that, maybe if you guys don't mind sharing to put you on the spot a bit, um, what was it that led you to pick one versus the other? Now, Val, I know you mentioned this a little bit, so I might start with you because you mentioned some, some complication, but I don't know if you want to maybe go into it a little bit more. I'll start with you and then we'll go to to Norm. Well, yeah, I because I had I had um, I wanted to do the the peritone peritone geneal because mm -hmm. I had a lot of fluid yeah. in my stomach from from my liver problems. That's why I went with that route. But then when I had the problems of bleeding internally, I and I ended up um, deciding that no, I'll just stick with what's already working for me. So I went back just to do the home chemo again because I just didn't want more complications. I have no idea why things just showed up on my screen just that. <laughs> I think sometimes when you say words, there's like AI and Zoom and it makes the animation <laughs> stuff. Yeah, you said balloons and balloons came up. Um, but um, yeah, so that that is definitely one of the reasons. There might be a medical, you know, reason or complication that puts you one way or the other. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Norm, if you don't mind saying, what was it that, that made you, uh, I think, a PD versus the home hemodialysis? I think the number one thing that made me choose was the flexibility to travel. And it just seemed to me that the PD uh offered more opportunity for travel than than the hemo but obviously that may not be the case but in my mind at the time that was the main reason i chose bd yeah yeah and that's a very good example of about you know the phrase we like to use is having dialysis that works around your life rather than the other way around right than having to work your life around dialysis and so yeah, that's a real common theme, I think, for both types of, of home dialysis. Yeah, yeah so as those of you on, on the call uh, can, can hear, it, it's not any one size fits all. It's really about thinking what's important to you, knowing about each treatment, and then saying, okay, what's going to be the best fit? And the other point I'll make, um, just like we talked about with catheters versus fistulas, not, you're not set in stone, right? So if you choose one and then decide maybe I want to explore the other one down the, the road, that happens all the time and definitely something. It's not like you have to pick now and forever hold your peace uh, type of thing. Um, okay. Um, oh, actually, this one can't be. I was about to start wrapping up, but this one could, uh, came up. So um, you were talking, uh, so this is back to home hemodialysis there. Uh, you were talking about, you know, thinking about numbers of hours per week. Uh, and someone mentioned, is there a reason, for example, they couldn't just do like two really long ones, like two six or seven hour ones, and then say you're covered for the whole week? Yeah, that's a good question. So what I didn't mention is we all, there is are parameters you have to follow. Um, if you think about it, with your kidneys working 24 hours a day, every day, you're constantly getting this gentle cleaning. With the dialysis, you're just getting the cleaning for the time that you're on the machine. So if you were to do six hours on Monday and six hours on Friday, you've now gone Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday without dialysis. Um, and then you just end up getting a lot of toxins build up. Um, probably have some fluid built up. Um, and so generally speaking, we say you should never have more than two days off from your dialysis. Um, and most people go one day off in the middle and then once in a while have two days off. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. And then outside of that, it's up to you. But exactly. We kind of set what are the some basic uh, rules to follow. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, OK. And then maybe I'll take the last because there's a couple little ones I'll just take to to, to wrap up here. One of them, which is also a very good question, was asking about is there a difference between infection rates on hemodialysis versus peritoneal dialysis? And here we're talking about home hemodialysis. So this, this would be hemodialysis in general. Um, the, the summary I kind of give there, and again, talking about how there's no one size fits all, um, I always tell people there's no free lunch, right? They both do come with complications. Um, on peritoneal dialysis, and this is on the whole in general, each person is different, but in general, Infections are a little bit more common on peritoneal dialysis, but also in general, not as severe of an item compared to when you're talking about hemodialysis and we have an infection that's in the bloodstream. That can be much more severe, but it's a less frequent item. 
And that, that's where I use that phrase, there's no free lunch, right? It's all about risks and balances. And so there's kind of trades off there. So that, that's the general statement about infections. Just mm -hmm. unfortunately, anytime you're putting anything into the body, there's an infection risk, right? So it's just something that we try to minimize, but it, it is always there, to be honest. Um, okay, and then there were a couple questions that have come through about specific vitamins and mineral supplements and stuff like that. I'll, I'll just suffice it to say, again, this is why we monitor blood work very frequently. We do have some routine supplements we give people, but then we do have dietitians that, that go through this uh, in a lot of detail. Um, one question was about certain medications or blood thinners and things like that. And again, in general, um, that doesn't necessarily force your hand one way or another for, for dialysis types. Uh, but um, uh, something to talk about with your specific kidney team, your specific care team uh, to go through. Um, and with that, I'm going to pull this up. There's one more, but I'm going to address it here on the slide, that, the last slide that I have in just a second here. Because um, as we're kind of winding down here, um, now we've had a lot of questions, which is great. Um, the other place that we want to get some of your feedback from, though, oops, uh, I went ahead, is that after the session, you'll be getting an email to give to a little feedback survey. We'd love to hear that. We'd love to hear, um, you know, anything else that, that you all have to say uh, to make this even better in the future. So please do that uh, feedback for us. That'd be great. So much appreciated. Um, and then lastly, the couple uh, of other places to look. So I've kind of shamelessly many times through the conversation here talked about the BC Renal website where we have a lot of these webinars. Go check that out, including this one. Usually give it a, a couple weeks and it'll be uploaded there if you wanted to watch it again, but all of the other sessions that we talked about. Um, the other question that I wanted to, to answer here, there was a question about, is there a place where people can go uh, to talk to other people who have done this, which is a fantastic question. Uh, and this is where I wanna highlight uh, the Kidney Foundation uh, okay. website. They're, and they're actually going through a real update where they're increasing the ability to do this even more, where people can connect with, with other individuals with all types of different kidney diseases, all types of different treatment types, and, and to learn from other people who have done it uh, themselves, which I think is super valuable. So that's a really good question, and, and there's a great resource uh, for that at the, the Kidney Foundation. Um, so otherwise, um, oh, what happened there? Uh, otherwise, with that, I just wanna take a moment here to thank everybody involved here for a really, really great presentation. Uh, Katie and Sarah, fantastic job uh, presenting, um, you know, what it is that we do with the two different types of dialysis. So thank you for that. Uh, Norm and Val, I can't say enough, you know, how important it is and how helpful it is for you guys to share your personal experience. That's one thing for us healthcare professionals to talk about it, but, you know, hearing from people who've actually gone through it is just super valuable. So, so thank you for taking the time to share your personal stories. That's, that's really, really appreciated. Um, I want to thank everybody for attending, and of course, I always want to thank the magic behind the scenes. We have uh, Janet, uh, Linda also has arranged this one, and we have Alexis, our tech guru, who makes all of this happen. So thank you guys for, for putting this all together. Uh, and then otherwise, yeah, thanks for attending. Hope we see you at uh, one of our upcoming uh, uh, webinars about a different topic.